Well, it really gives me a tremendous amount of pleasure to introduce my very close friend, Lori Banoff Kaufman. She uh, is uh, uh, just um, an unusual, wonderful person. Lori was born in New Orleans and grew up in Charleston, South Carolina. She is, a, uh, this is her debut fiction author uh, is at the uh, ripe young age of 61. After a twisty- 62 by detour, now, but who's counting? <laughs> <laughs> lofty, um, uh, high-tech company. She was a consultant at the high-tech companies. She has an undergraduate degree from Princeton and a master's from Harvard. She lives in Israel and has been living in Israel for many, many, many years with her husband and her four adult children. Uh, Lori has written a, an amazing book about the first century and when Rome had taken over Jerusalem. And so I want to let Lori talk about the book, but also talk about what created why she went ahead to uh, do all the research and uh, tell you her uh, re why she wanted to write this book. So I'm going to just let Lori start and um, love it. Love okay. you, Lori. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. And thank you so much for inviting me. It's really, it's an honor and a pleasure to be here today. Um, so I don't know if you've had a chance to read the book, but I'll, so I'll give you a little bit of background. Rebel Daughter, which was published by Random House in February, um, is about one of the most exciting periods in Jewish history, which is the Jewish revolt against Rome in the first century. Um, it's based on a true story of a young woman who survived the fighting and the rebellion, who was captured as a slave when the temple fell, uh, sold in Rome and freed by her owner who fell in love with her. And her, this woman, is, it's a true story, her, um, her gravestone was discovered in the Bay of Naples and it caused a, a very big excitement in the archeological scholarly community because it was the first physical proof that Jewish slaves from Jerusalem were taken to Rome. And we know now, this is a few years later, that um, the Colosseum was built with the spoils from the temple treasury, was built by Jewish slaves. Uh, there was a big Jewish community in Rome in the first century. And this is part of that, of that history. Um, I heard about this gravestone just by chance. I was having dinner in Tel Aviv with an old friend who was a uh, professor of, his, of the classics department and the history department at Tel Aviv University. And he was working on a project to catalog inscriptions of the ancient world with universities from all over the world. And his portion of this uh, research was to catalog inscriptions from Israel. And he was telling me about the things that he found and there wasn't really anything new or exciting. And I, I said, well, you know, tell me something, you know, exciting, tell me something that you didn't know before. And he told me about this gravestone that was discovered in Italy. And I just thought this was so interesting. I wanted to know how two people whose, um, you know, nations were fierce enemies ended up falling in love because her gravestone was erected by her Roman owner who had married her and freed her. And um, it's just a few Latin lines, but it was a very, uh, it's a very emotional inscription. And I was very captivated by this love story. I was always interested in history and I've loved historical fiction, but to me, historical fiction was World War II or maybe the Civil War since I'm from Charleston, but I didn't really know much about ancient history, first century. And, and as I began doing a little bit of research, I did find out that everything I knew and that I had been taught was actually wrong. You know, we, we were all brought up with the stories of the brave fighters at, of Masada 
And, you know, when you look at it a little bit differently from a historical lens rather than a rabbinical lens, you know, some of these stories take on a different, um, uh, you know, different meanings. And, and you realize there, were a lot, there was a lot of religious fanaticism, um, unbridled nationalism, um, hatred, civil hatred, the civil discord that, that led to civil war, all these uh, Par uh, in, a, in a way parallels with our, our world today. So it made this history, which I had thought was so foreign and so um, so long ago, 2000 years ago, it made it alive to me. So I initially was interested in the story really because of this personal, um, the, the personal stories of these two people, this Roman uh, owner and a Jewish slave. And as I researched, I became much more involved in the history and, and just, I spent, ended up spending 10 years researching it. Um, I felt an obligation to these real world people to get the story right. I felt that, uh, you know, most people, also most readers, they hadn't, they probably have not read a lot about this period. It's not like World War II where you know people have some kind of context for what's going on. So I had to really um, dive into a lot of details, you know, the, the way people uh, lived then and dressed and ate and, and what did Jerusalem look like and, and all of that to, to bring it to life for the reader was, was more of a challenge because it's not an era that we're really familiar with. So that was um, challenging, but also a lot of fun. I, I live in Israel, so I could go visit these places and, and, you know, an hour away and I'm in Jerusalem and I'm walking on the same stones that my characters walked on. And I, I wanted to be there to be able to, you know, be able to describe the heat from the stones going through the, their sandals or her, my character's eyes burning from the, the smoke of the sacrifices and what she would have heard and seen and, and what the food tasted like and all that. I could, you know, go and see how the light uh, reflected off the, st the walls and, and really bring it to life because I was there. The other thing is that there's so many experts in Israel about this time period. Um, I, I worked very closely with uh, my historical consultant, Professor Jonathan Price, who's really one of the world's experts on the first century, the Jewish revolt, and also about Josephus, who was a character in my novel. And he introduced me every time I had a question to the other, the other experts. I also worked with a professor named Professor Lee Levine, who um, is an expert on, on the layout of, of Jerusalem in that time period. And when I had a question about Jewish magic, I was able to talk to the world's experts. So being surrounded by this um, brain trust really um, made the book uh, I think authentic in a way that a lot of historical fiction, you know, isn't. And and I probably and I totally overshot it. I didn't need to spend ten years, you know, doing this. I didn't need to spend weeks researching how face cream was made in the first century from sheep fat or all the other little, um, you know, diversions that I that I went down. But I just became so interested in it all. And again, I I really wanted to get it right. I know that when I read. Uh, a book of the historical novel, the first thing I want to know when it's, when I finish is how much of this is true. And so I really tried to make sure that everything in the book, while obviously it didn't happen, I had to imagine a lot, it could have happened. Um, my main source, in addition to the, uh, the scholars in Israel and abroad, were the works of Josephus, who many of you may remember from way back, uh, was a Jewish historian who, um, a very interesting character who I tried to bring to life in the book. Um, he was an eyewitness to this revolt. And he started out as um, an aristocratic Jewish priest in Jerusalem. He became a general in the Jewish revolt. 
he cap he was captured himself by the Romans, and in the Roman camp, he became friendly with the Roman emperor. He ended up switching sides, moving to Rome, and writing a history of this time period. And there were a lot of revolts and rebellions in the Roman Empire during this time period. And Rome ruled the world from, you know, Britannia, with today's England, all the way to Africa. And a lot was happening, but we, it's lost to us. It's lost to our generation. We don't know what those little wars and skirmishes were. We know about this because Josephus' writings were preserved and they were preserved because of the church. Josephus had one of the early sightings of Jesus that he, he talks about. And the Christians, the early Christians and later Christians, the monks and the monasteries, they had an interest in preserving these writings, um, not only because Josephus mentions Jesus, but also they believe that uh, the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem was proof that Jesus's prophecies uh, actually came true. So this is an important event, not only in Jewish history, but also in Christian history. It's very important for us, obviously, for a lot of reasons, but we know that after the destruction of the temple um, was the time when Judaism was, I, as a marketing, someone with a marketing background, I say this was the greatest rebranding effort in the history of the world because uh, Judaism t became, instead of a religion based around sacrifices in the temple, uh, it changed to a religion based on study and prayer and uh, ritual that was community-based and not uh, temple-centric. Um, so it's very important for us as well because it was the beginning of the Judaism that we, that we know today. Um, one of the, the questions on the historical side that just so fascinated me, and I'm still fascinated by it, is why did the Jews of Judea, which was a small province, remote province on the eastern edge of the, of the Roman Empire, why did they revolt against the greatest empire the world had ever known? There were hundreds of thousands of well-trained, fierce soldiers in the Roman army. Um, the, they were, the legions were, were notorious and people knew about them. And yet the Jews revolted and they had no army. <laughs> so to me, it's, you know, you think, were these people crazy? I mean, what, were they suicidal? Why would you declare war on the greatest empire the world has ever known with no army? And that was the question that started this search. And there are a lot of answers to that question. Um, and there's still a lot of controversy today, not only about the revolt, why the Jews uh, revolted and, and how, it, how it progressed, um, but also Josephus's role, who was a very controversial character in the day. The Jews thought he was a traitor. Um, and uh, still a very controversial character today. Um, and I have mixed feelings about that because on the one hand, you know, he could have been considered a traitor. He started out on the Jewish side and he became a Roman. On the other hand, maybe it was an act of statecraft that he was trying to advocate for the Jewish people. He knew that they were on a suicidal a suicide mission and he wanted to mitigate the disaster. So again, there's a lot here in this period. And by focusing on this love story, I kind of opened up the whole, the whole history. Um, and it's it's really interesting. We uh, seem to lost the voice. We can't hear you. Oh, Larry. sorry. How how much do you have it back? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. How much did you lose? My, a minute. A minute. <laughs> okay. Okay. So anyway, um, I'm just about to, to wind it up and open up to questions, but um, I would just like to say that I picked this, this 
uh, voice, this person to take us into that time period, because I think it's fascinating to look at the forgotten voices of history, the women, the children, the slaves. Those are viewpoints that we don't really uh, get exposed to. And, and I think that's um, a very rich way to look at, at some of these historical events that we might have learned about from, from a completely different viewpoint. So I think that's enough of a background about the history of the time period that I chose, a little bit about how I got roped into it, a little bit about the, the research process, and a little bit about the characters. But I'm happy to open it up. Feel free to ask me anything, even if you've read the book, if you haven't, and, you know, if you don't have questions, I can I can go on and on, but uh, I'm happy to hear what you, to talk about what you're interested in hearing about. I I um I have a question. Hold on. Sure. Uh, I'm wondering exactly what is the time frame? Uh, was <laughs> it in, in reference to the birth of Jesus and the whole? Thing that was going on uh, mm -hmm. when he died. Mm -hmm. When did this take place? Okay. To that? Right. Okay. So the, um, well, Jesus was born in the year, I mean, according one. to our, you know, one, <laughs> he died in the year 40. The Jewish revolt began in the year 64, even though there were some things a little bit, um, you know, before that. And the temple was destroyed in the year 70. So it was only a few years after um, Jesus's death. And at that time, which is very interesting to realize, is that Christians were considered Jews. Right. They were very much, they very much considered themselves a sect of Judaism. And the Jews considered themselves a Jewish sect. There were a lot of messiahs in this period, by the way. Um, and the, the rabbis talk about some of them, but... Um, a lot of people were predicting the end of the, the, the kingdom of God coming, the apocalypse. Um, and there were a lot of people preaching the end of the world. Um, there were a lot of sects and, or faction, factions in, of Jews at this time period. Um, the ones that you might have heard about, the zealots, uh, the Sakari, who are the ones that were assassins. They, I talk about them in my book. The Pharisees, who went on to found rabbinic Judaism, the Sadducees, um, and the Christians. And after the destruction of the temple, the only ones that really survived were the Christians and the Pharisees. The other people, the other factions, their whole... Oh, and there was also the uh, Essenes, who were the cult from the Dead Sea. If you've been to Israel and you, you've seen the Dead Sea Scrolls, that was another faction. Um, they all drifted away, fell up. They, their whole raison d'etre was to fight each other. And once the temple was gone and there was no one to fight against, they kind of slipped away. And the only people that were left were the Pharisees who went on to found, as I said, rabbinic Judaism and the Christians who founded their own, their own religion. Are there any other questions? Okay. I, I just was, uh, while you were talking, I was really thinking in terms of with Josephus. Now, so the history that he wrote would be part of the uh, Roman side of the history. Am I right? Did well, he wrote it for a Roman audience, and that's true. But he very much tried to... Um, portray the Jews in a sympathetic light. And he explains, he has almost 30 volumes of, of Jewish history. And um, he also wrote uh, something against, uh, it's called a, um, Against Appion, which is basically the first treatise to deal with anti-Semitism, where he kind of uh, defends the Jewish people. He was very much a proud Jew till the end, even though he became a Roman. And the interesting thing about Rome is you could be Roman, you could have Roman citizenship and be Jewish. Um, you know, it was a very liberal society for that time period. Mm, um, yeah. And there was a lot of fluidity then, and he was very much, uh, he never renounced his Judaism, but he took a Roman name. He was, he was Josephus, son of Matthias, was his Jewish name, jo, uh, Josephus ben Matatiahu, 
and he took a Roman name, Flavius Josephus. He um, ended up getting one of the ro- the emperor's houses to live in and, and an imperial stipend. So he was sitting pretty. And the Jews at the, of the time were very angry and there was a plot to assassinate him. And um, they never forgave him because he was at first very against the revolt. He, had one, he was one of the few Jews in Jerusalem who had actually been to Rome and knew the, the power and grandeur of Rome. The Sanhedrin had sent him a few years before to Rome to uh, try to get some Jewish priests released from a Roman prison. And that's a whole nother interesting story. He was successful. He got himself, uh, he got friendly with the emperor's wife and he wheedled his way into the palace and he was able to secure the release of these Jewish priests. And he came back to to Jerusalem um, as a young priest, really one of the the Jewish princes, you know, he had royal blood. He was related to Judah Maccabee. Um, the Maccabeem were, you know, the, from the has, um, the Hashbonaim, the the Hanukkah story heroes. He was related to them through his mother. He was considered Jewish aristocracy. He was against the revolt when the Jews started. Um, being offended by Rome and by all the um, the insults and the the terrible management of some of the Roman governors, he very much um, was against it. He says, you don't know what you're doing. This is crazy. We'll never beat Rome. But in the end, like most of the Jewish population, he acquiesced and he joined and he became the, he was appointed general of the North, which was the most important military position. And he was fighting up north because the the Romans were coming through the north of the country until they on their way to Jerusalem. So it was very important to stop the Roman troops. He was defeated in a big battle at Yotfat. And there's a scene that he writes about that's very, very reminiscent of the Masada story. There were 40 fighters left in a cave. And instead of surrendering to the Roman, instead of surrendering to the Romans and becoming slaves, he convinced them that they need to kill each other. And because suicide is not allowed, they drew lots. Again, this story is very familiar, I'm sure, but it's it happened years before in a place called Yotfat. He convinced the soldiers that they need to draw lots and everyone is going to kill his friend. He he writes about this. It's it's in chilling detail how the, the blood was up to their ankles. And when there were two people left, he says, oh, you know, I've had another revelation from God. God not only told us we needed to, to kill each other. Now he's told me that I need to live. <laughs> so he convinced the other person that they should turn themselves into the Romans. And that's how he ended up in the camp. And when he got to the camp, there was a Roman, uh, the, the Roman general who was uh, trying to put down this Jewish revolt was named Vespasian. And he goes to Vespasian and says, I've had a vision. You're going to be emperor one day. And he ingratiated himself with the Roman emperor. But lo and behold, after a year, civil war broke out in Rome and Vespasian was called back to Rome and he was anointed emperor. Mm-hmm. So um, he believed that Josephus, Jos- Joseph, who became Josephus when he became a Roman, really did have this power of prophecy. And so um, he became an advisor to not only Vespasian, but to Vespasian's son, who was named Titus, um, who Vespasian sent back to Rome, uh, sorry, was sent back to Jerusalem to finish putting down the Jewish revolt. Um, because Vespasian now was emperor of Rome. So he sent his son Titus to finish the revolt. And Titus is, Titus's troops are the ones who did destroy the temple. Um, and he writes about it, um, you know, day by day, almost hour by hour, what happened. And the Jews were just carried away by this 
this frenzy that God was on their side and that God would help them defeat the evil empire. And they saw signs everywhere in the book of Daniel. And, and you know, you can find anything when you start looking and, and a lot of these, um, you know, verses and, and they believed it. And in the beginning, they were sure that they were right because against all odds, some of the early battles, the Jews did win. And that gave them this courage to um, to keep fighting. But you might have heard the term sinat chinam, which means brotherly hatred. And that's what the rabbis say was the cause of, of our defeat was that we were fighting each other. And when the Romans, the Romans initially came to put down the revolt, I mean, then they had their own civil war and they went back to Rome for two years. And during that time, the Jews just tore each other to pieces. Um, and in fact, they, uh, there was enough food in Jerusalem that they had stockpiled um, so that if the Romans came back and laid siege to Jerusalem, which is exactly what happened, because that's how ancient warfare was conducted, that the Jews would have been able to survive. There, there, there are springs in Jerusalem, so there was water, and they had enough food, according to the rabbis, to last 27 years. And what happened was there were so many different fighting factions, they ended up burning each other's food stores. So when the Romans did finally come back, the Jews starved to death. And the Romans kind of sat out around the city and said, let's let them tear each other to pieces and then we'll go in. And that's exactly what happened. And the temple was destroyed. Are there any other? Is this, is this all in this book? Uh, this yes. yes. Well, yes. I mean, I said that this, the story is set during this time. And um, my character, um, Esther, uh, we know that she grew up in Jerusalem and that she was taken as a slave to Rome because the gravestone says Claudia Esther, war captive of Jerusalem. And the gravestone is from the year, you know, in the early 70s. So war captive of Jerusalem, it had to be that she was taken as a captive after this, um, you know, after the battle of, uh, of Jerusalem. And it says in the gravestone that she died when she was 25. So if we extrapolate, we know how old she was. And so if she lived in Jerusalem during this time, which she did, she would have seen all of this. And um, Esther, another interesting fact, is a aristocratic name. Um, so I had her father being a priest yeah. of the temple. The, aristoc the aristocrats of that period were all um, landowners and they were priests in the temple, but that didn't mean they worked full time in the temple. The priests only worked two weeks a year, but they were considered the, the nobility. And they lived well. They lived very well off of the labors of the rest of the population because the rest of the population gave them tithes. They gave them, you know, 10% of their of uh, their income. They also brought sacrifices. They would bring, you know, animals to sacrifice in the temple and the aristocrats, the priests would take the, the meat and eat it. <laughs> so they were living very well. And that was another reason that people say that there was... Um, uh, that they wanted to go to war because there was this um, huge income inequality. There was overtaxation. The Jews had to pay the temple taxes. They had to pay the Roman taxes. Um, there was a, it was tough. And they, um, they wanted to overthrow the, the existing order too. And the aristocrats were, and the priests were seen as um, doing Rome's work. They were, they were seen as the Roman, as the enemy in the beginning too. So there were a lot of uh, societal tensions within the Jewish community. Well, so were they the, what we now call the Kohanim? Yes, the Kohanim, uh, or the aristocrats. Uh, uh, Jesus and his, his followers. Right. Were, and most, yeah, fighting. they were the money changers in the temple. Uh, yeah. That was their thing. They were against the Jewish aristocracy of the time. And that was very typical. There were a lot of Jews who were against the privileged class. 
right. um, because they were milking the rest of the population. I mean, it's not all of them, but but many of them. And they and they are stories of all the of of their um, corrupt, you know, corrupt behavior. So there was there was a lot of truth to that, actually. That was the wonderful part of reading this wonderful book. Uh, I loved every minute of it. And Lori, your talk brings everything to light. I remember uh, all the different parts <laughs> of how you intertwine all uh -huh. the history uh, with Esther. Right. And, nice to uh, hear. And uh, yes, it was uh, quite uh, an, uh, a wonderful book. And I would love every one of you to um, uh, either get the book uh, and or use it uh, as you, uh, our book group should definitely read it. And uh, um, and so I'm really, really quite happy right. that I was able right. to bring Lori to all of you. Um, right. Well, it's been a pleasure to be here. I just have one request, which is if you've read it, if you could please leave an Amazon review or Goodreads, it just makes a huge difference in the, uh, in the search algorithm. It's very hard to... Uh, you know, rise above all the good books that are out there. And I'd, I'd love more people to know about it. So that would be very helpful if you do buy it or, or get it from your library, if you if you could write an Amazon review. You don't have to have bought the book to write the review. You <laughs> okay. And, um, and you, yeah, and you don't have to write very much. It's, it's, it's based on um, quantity, not quality. So even if you just say, I enjoyed this, that's also very helpful for me. So I would really appreciate that. It just um, answers you got it. <laughs> just have it get. Okay. Anyone else want to have a comment? About uh, yeah, actually, I have a comment. Um, I I just I just started reading it because I was going to order the book and then I got it off off a of Kindle. Great. So mm -hmm. I I I want. There's so much I want to say. I just started reading it, but I, I feel like I'm already real. I love a book that just reels you in and takes you back in time. And you feel like you're on the journey with the author being you and the characters. And I, I can so relate to Esther, by the way. <laughs> I, feel, I feel like I was Esther. Um, Wonderful. And I feel like Jerusalem also was just a major character, you know. And, and after, after being in Israel in 2018, um, I can understand. And it's like I felt like when I was touring Israel, and going through the history during the tour. And then after, you know, starting to read this book, I said, oh my God, I can relate to so much of this. And it must have been a journey for you to write this book. It wasn't just your research. I have to believe that you, you, you took yourself on a journey while you were doing the research and writing this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I did. And I've always loved writing and I wanted to. And I didn't ever feel like I had the right story to tell. And then I just kept getting deeper and deeper into this one. And I'm, I'm very happy to hear that it did transport you because that's what I wanted. I, I wanted it to be time travel for the reader. I didn't want it to feel like a history lesson or, um, you know, I really wanted to bring the period alive the way it, it became alive for me. So it's thrilling it that it worked for you. Thank you, Lisa. I. I, I also wonder if you uh, thought in terms of parallels of Israel today and what's going on with divisions in the, you know, politic in the body. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you're so right, Eva. I mean, that's a question that comes up a lot. And I didn't... Um, I think it was something just, you know, in the back of my mind that a little depressing, you know, things have really not changed so much. But um, what's interesting about this whole time period is how um, so um, current it is, even to people in Israel, whenever there's uh, disagreements or, you know, things get a little too heated. People say, what, you know, we don't want to get to where we were before. It's as if it just happened. And that's what's so fascinating to me is that this, you know, this time period 2000 years ago is still so much a part of our collective memory as Jews. You know, Rabbi Sachs um, said, of, of the, who was the chief rabbi of, of England who died recently, that history is what happens to other people 
but um, memory is, you know, our story. And this is our story. And it's still so, um, it's still so much a part, even of the, of the current discourse. People talk about this and, and we think about the temple. My daughter just got married a few weeks ago. And when we smashed the, the glass at the wedding ceremony, you know, we, again, we talk about the temple and it's just, it's, it's amazing that something that could have happened so long ago still feels like, um, you know, it's a warning for us today and it's something we need to remember. And there's a reason that so much of our ritual is built around remembering this because it is a cautionary tale. You know, it's uh, what can happen when the civil discord gets out of hand. Luckily, we're nowhere near what it was then, even though people in Israel say that we are. But they were, the, the different factions were murdering each other. They were kidnapping each other's families, torturing their wives. I mean, they were just, it was barbaric what was going on then when you actually get into the history of it. But it still serves very much as a cautionary tale of um, Jews fighting Jews, which is you know the red line that nobody ever wants to get to. So um, I don't think we're there yet, but it's still very much a part of the public discourse today. Great question. <laughs> Could okay. I ask a question? Sure. Mm -hmm. So um, I had actually seen your this presentation a while back uh, around Tisha B'Av time. Uh -huh. Mm -hmm. And I think it was with Professor Paula Fredrickson and oh, the organization, right. I don't remember, but the title of it at, at then was um, The 2,000-Year-Old Woman. And I thought what was going to be discussed was Jerusalem, but it was actually this woman, Esther, who you mm -hmm. researched, and I, I found it fascinating. Um, you had mentioned Masada, and my question is, in your research, you know, we we remember the temple with Tisha B'Av and we remember Hanukkah, but we don't seem to, to have a holiday or a commemoration for Masada. And I was wondering if in your research you came across any information or mm -hmm. reason for that, or maybe there is some obscure holiday that, that I'm not aware of. Do mm -hmm. you, can you shed any light on that? Well, um, I think the real, like, I, I'm not a, you know, a Judaic scholar, but I can tell you that when I did research into Masada, I realized that everything I had been taught was wrong, that they really, the people that were at the Masada were murderous fanatics. They're the ones that kind of drag the Jewish population into this uh, war. They were uh, the Sakari, the, the most fanatic of the fanatic. They were assassinating uh, Jews, not Romans. They were fighting the Jews who they thought were collaborators of the Romans. And those were some of the, the priests. And they kind of stirred up all this trouble by killing each other. And then they fled. They were basically kicked out of Jerusalem by the population. And they fled to um, Ein Gedi, where they murdered the whole population of uh, hundreds of people in Ein Gedi. And then they went to Masada, where they, they hid out. So this so they this were was, Jewish people. They, they were, were Jewish, but they were the most fanatic of the fanatic. It would be like today, the most extreme uh, fanatic settlers saying, mm -hmm. you know, we're going to take on, you know, we're going to fight the U.S., China, Russia, all the Arab countries and follow us. You know, we need to get rid of the foreign infidels. You know, that's who these people were. And um they weren't a very nice gang. So um, I think that the beginning, uh, you know, when you look at the, the history of the state of Israel, we wanted to create some national myths and the kind of rebranding, the retelling of the Masada story was um, not exactly how it happened historically. You know, Israel wanted, um, needed some, some, heroes and turn, kind of rework the Masada story to fit, the, I think, the the Israel narrative, the, the 1948 narrative, that we were, you know, a, we were facing, you know, tremendous odds, and yet, you know, we did the, the bravest thing. And for many years, the soldiers of the IDF were inducted into the Israeli army at Masada, but that's changed. 
And they don't take the soldiers to Masada and say, this is an example of, uh, this is something we want to emulate. They don't do that anymore. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, revisionist history with some of these early um, myths in Israel. And this is definitely one of them where people are saying, wait a minute, you know, why didn't they try to bargain? Why did, what, what's so great about killing yourself? And, you know, and, and who were these people anyway? So there's been a examination of that. And so I don't think, I mean, it's, it's certainly a story that's told now, but even if you go to Masada and to the museum, they tell it much more nuanced than probably the version that you might've heard when you were, you know, in confirmation class or getting bat mitzvah, because that's, that was certainly the myth that I grew up on. And, and it's not really told that way anymore. Interesting. Thank you for shedding mm -hmm. light on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The, the talk that you referred to was a talk that I gave at the National Library of Israel with my historical consultant. And you mentioned uh, Dr. Paula Fredrickson, who was an expert on early Christianity. And if anyone's interested in that side of it, it's online at the National Library of Israel site. But it's she is fascinating because she really goes into more about the early Christian um, Jewish relations. And one thing that surprised me about the book is how receptive the Christians have been um, as, as readers. And again, I, I said why they, it's his, important historically for them, but um, the book has been nominated for something called the Christie by the Evangelical Christian Publishers Association. And um, they very, they're very proud that they have uh, shared roots with the Jewish people. And again, they, they look to this, the destruction of Jerusalem and the temple as something, a seminal event for Christianity, which is, I had no idea about when I, you know, did any of the research or wrote the book. So that's been a, a real surprise to me. The other thing about that lecture is, is you showed the actual tombstone of this woman, Esther, and right. I found that fascinating with the yeah, Latin I should have writing. had a yeah, I should have you had can a look slide. it up. It, it, you can <laughs> just Google it and find it mm -hmm. if anyone wants to. Is there a way for us to get a link to that lecture? Uh, yes, um, on my if you go to my website, which is um, lauriekaufman.com. Um, and with just, a double in, it's L O R I K A U F M A N N two N's Lori Kaufman dot com, and I have I have a link to to that and to the tombstone and and lots of other lectures and um, there. If you do want to use the book for any kind of book group or uh, book club, there are some discussion questions. They're also on the Jewish Book Council. Uh, website. There's an article about the, the tombstone and a picture of the tombstone in addition to the book discussion question. So either on the Jewish Book Council or um, on my site. I have all the, I have links to all of that. Hadassah group, a book group here. I think this would be a very interesting uh, mm -hmm. read. So I want to give our book leaders, you know, this information. Yeah, so I'm happy to zoom in. I've been doing a lot of Hadassah events. I actually have a Naamat event in an hour. On I, I've spoken to a lot of Hadassah groups, uh, you know, through the Jewish Book Council. So, um, but I'm happy to zoom in, and I don't take an honorarium. So I'm just, I just love, I love talking about the book. I love meeting the readers. So um, just let me know. Just you can send me through my website a uh, a, a message, and I'll get back to you. Okay. That's great. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay. I think I'll sign off. <laughs> but, uh, thank you very much. It was a pleasure. And uh, I hope you have a, a nice uh, rest of the holiday. <laughs>